Hi, this is Dr. Jeffrey Epstein. I want to thank uh, Dr. Quetel and the rest of the um, the organizers of the Global Summit of Facial Plastic Surgery. I understand Dr. Carniol is doing the um, moderation. Um, I will be available for questions at the end of the um, at the end of the session. Um, uh, I've been specializing in hair restoration surgery as a facial plastic surgeon since 1994. Upon completion of my fellowship with Shelley Kabaker. Um, I now do uh, strictly hair restoration and hairline lowering surgery. Um, and it's a, for me, it's been an incredibly rewarding career. I'm very involved with the, uh, with the Hair Society. I'm editor of the, uh, co-editor of the Hair Transplant Forum International. But I have a strong belief that facial plastic surgeons have a unique opportunity to be performing hair restoration and treating patients with hair loss, particularly given our surgical expertise, as well as our aesthetic appreciation. So and no further ado, I'm gonna start talking. I have nothing to disclose. The, uh, the evolution of hair restoration surgery has been the uh, creation of more, uh, more and more natural appearing results, not only of hairlines, but of eyebrows, beards, eyelashes, pubic area. We're now using beard, uh, particularly beard, but also other hairs from the body for restoring hair to the scalp. Um, we can also do um, hairline long surgery, which I'm going to go into a bit. And uh, we're, we're now doing genetic testing to determine the best therapies or help guide the best therapies for hair loss and more than I'm going to be covering all this. Before and after 2100 grafts, FUE procedure. Um, just going to give you some examples. Here's an example of a combined strip was called FUT or follicular unit transplantation with FUE, follicular unit extraction. I call it a hybrid because I'm actually making a strip and then supplementing that with FUE grafts taken from below the, the strip, above and on the sides. Main advantage of that combined approach is we get the best grafts from the central area of the scalp, particularly in women. Um, and I'll talk about the indications for FUT. Um, where women particularly can get a, a nice result with FUT or a strip. Uh, but also we're minimizing the length of the incision. In the old days, if you wanted more than 15, 1600 grafts, the incision needed to go even over the ears. I no longer uh, make incisions that go beyond the nuchal ridges. I limit my incision to the back of the head where it heals up the best, least at risk of scarring, and then all FUE for getting additional grafts if needed. And you can see the before and the after, the before and the after. And the donor site strip is sutured, is removed and sutured closed as opposed to follicular unit extraction. And here I show how uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wad drill is, is drilling and then the grafts are extracted one at a time using, in this case, a 0.85 millimeter recipient site. And these are the follicular units that we're tracking. We wanna take the thickest follicular units and you basically we're extracting them in one, two, most commonly two and three hairs per graft. And these are our follicular unit grafts. These are really pretty grafts, small cuff of fat. The bulge is right around here, which is where the regenerative cells are located. And then you've got the hairs emerging. With the strip, a, a single sliver, uh, a single strip is slivered under the microscope and then it's subdivided into one, two, and three hair grafts. So the second stage of the uh, follicular grafting after the slivering is the, uh, is the dissecting of the individual grafts. And we're, what we're doing essentially is eliminating most non-hair bearing tissue. However, strip grafts or FUT grafts are still larger, thicker than the typically FUE grafts. And I'll talk a little more about that. And here you can see the slivering being done. It's a very uh, technically um, specific procedure. Then the team of assistants are dissecting grafts, and then these are the grafts, and then they're being planted. We don't do it this way really anymore. Um, I, most cases are now done with four people, and I'll show you how that's utilized, how that team is utilized. Um, in a case of, in this case, 3,800 grafts done in a single procedure over two days, patient had prior hairline advancement with brow reduction in this male to female uh, gender reassignment patient. But I did a single procedure of 3,800 grafts. This was done by a combined FUT, which supplemented with FUE grafts, and uh, which is basically the hybrid. For uh, reparative procedures, in this case, patient had prior strip work done. In this case, we're, all we're doing is trying to um, give them as natural look as possible. In this case, it was done with FUT. 
whereby grafts were removed uh, from the old donor site scar, we took a wider strip, and then we just did additional grafting. No other work was done to create a more natural appearance. Basically what I did was I restored much better density and I used these individual larger plugs to actually serve as areas where I would supplement, put more grafts in front of them. You can sort of see a plug was here and I put more grafts here, a plug was here, I put more grafts here. So actually I used that, those plugs to actually create a more irregular pattern in this reparative case. The indications for follicular unit transplantation are particularly females, particularly those undergoing large numbers of grafts in order to avoid the extensive scalp shaving or also the another approach, which is the no shave FUE, which I will explain as well. However, I would say maybe 40% of my female patients wind up getting FUT, the rest choose to get FUE for the main reason that they don't like the concept of an incision, plus healing is easier, very quick, in fact, there's typically very little to no discomfort after an FUE procedure in the donor area. And in an FUT, uh, typically the first two nights, there's gonna be some discomfort. And the other indication for doing FUT is men who have had a prior donor site strip who desire, desire to repeat the procedure and are happy to undergo it. Although most of my prior strip patients I've done in the past are now returning and getting FUE. And I explained to patients um, that, um, or explained to colleagues that, you know, there's still this, for those doctors that are, do not have extensive experience in doing FUE work, they will tend to over-recommend still FUT. Regrowth rates with FUE are as good, in my case, or in my opinion, actually, in my experience, it's actually a higher rate of regrowth. We definitely prefer FUE grafts in almost all cases. So really, there's very little, and very little indications anymore for doing FUT. Yes, you can argue that the total graft supply is greater when you do an FUT or FUT combined with hybrid. Maybe the total graft supply would be around 8,000 to 9,000 grafts, as opposed to all FUE, where it's more commonly the total supply would be around 6,000 grafts. However, I'm going to talk about the use of body hair, which adds another two to 3,000 grafts. So, so we're really able to address those issues and then, or that, that limitation, and then on top of it, my main concern with FU, uh, I mean, the main advantage of FUE is that a patient does decide to shave his head uh, in the future that won't, or even cut it really short, there's no risk of a, a donor site scar. And you can see a before and an after, a nice result achieved uh, to restore density. And you can see how nice the donor area looks. Patient can cut his hair as short as he wants. This is uh, post-up day one and long-term FUE in this case, Patient, uh, uh, black patient, I used a 0 0.9 uh, punch. Most commonly I'm using 0 0.85. So there may be very slight dots. I'm gonna talk about the use of scalp micropigmentation if the, those cases do occur. Another patient, another black patient before and after 2200 grafts successfully achieved. I actually like FUE with, with black patients. It was one of the first group of patients. I embraced FUE in the early days simply because um, the risk of donor site scarring was unacceptably high, particularly in this population group that tends to wanna to cut their hair short. But we're able to get really nice results if you use proper technique. Let's talk about follicular unit extraction, whereby or FUE, each graft gets removed one at a time. The, uh, the original techniques involved the use of handheld punches, 0 0.8 to 0 0.95 millimeters. Then we went to handheld drills. The newer system, which is really the state of the art in our experience, is the WAS system uh, based out of Belgium or the Trevolini system based out of Paraguay. All these systems use, instead of a rot rotary uh, motion of the punch, it's actually an oscillating. In addition, the punches, instead of being sharp, they're actually hybrid. So they have an, a fluted outer edge, which is sharp. Therefore, the inner edge, which is smooth, is the only thing that, that, um, that uh, has contact with the follicles. Thus, uh, the rate of transection rate is reduced. The rate of transection is reduced to below 5%. Of course, you heard about the automated extraction devices, NeoGraph, they're heavily marketed. SmartGraft is another example. Uh, their main advantage, they provide turnkey operation. You can hire technicians. Uh, they pr pr promote an assignable model where basically a doctor, all he has to do is buy the machine and hire the doctors, hire the technicians. Um, I'm not gonna go into the politics or the legality or, or even the ethics of this. I do feel that physicians need to play a more active role and not just make this a purely delegable procedure. I hope that when you go ahead and see my results and see how nice they can come out, 
uh, I do feel that there's a role for, surg for surgeons to be involved. There's nothing like having a surgeon to be there. Remember, this is a permanent procedure. The results are permanent. I'm gonna stop there. And then of course, I talked about the artist robot. And here you can see how the, the artist versus the raw system, just less traumatic. And uh, it's a sharp punch with the artist. This is a, a more refined approach. When I show this video to my patients, most of them will say, I'll take the one on the, the right. I'll take the, the less traumatic system. And a before and after 3,800 grafts done uh, in a day and a half, one, a single procedure. And another case, 3,500 grafts, FUE, shave FUE. So was it, we're able to do this in a single day. The back and sides of his head were shaved. Another case of 1,800 grafts before and after. Gray hair can be a little bit tough to work with, mainly in the uh, recipient area. Uh, it, it's difficult to visualize sometimes as these hairs emerge from the scalp, and this is a greater risk of transection, but you can see what the results that we can achieve. Um, let's talk about hairline design. Uh, there's basically, uh, there's several important concepts. The first is the proper position or the height. Most commonly, I go with the vertical forehead meets the horizontal scalp. You can also talk about the rule of thirds, particularly that's important in women and men. It's not as much of a relevance because you often expect to have a higher hairline. Uh, you also want the proper shape, which is the recession. You don't, on, on, on Frankfurt horizontal, you don't want to see it go down. You actually want to see a little bit of upward turn. You need to make sure when you're designing the hairline, the placement of it, that you're accounting for future hair loss because hair loss is progressive. And let's talk about the macro irregularity, which refers to the irregular shape of the hairline to avoid a bowl, like that direct linear experience. You want the hairline to be sort of irregular in appearance with an irregular, irregu irregular irregularity. Um, so those are the concepts, that's the concepts in design. And then let's talk about the concepts at the level of the graph with hairline design. Besides the fact you need to use appropriately sized graphs, particularly all single hair graphs, although I use two hair graphs to create the irregularity in these little clusters, um, or these little bundles, and then I put single hairs to feather it after the irregularity has been achieved. But the things to think about is, I call these the, the three shuns, the proper angulation, proper direction and the proper distribution where you have ones and twos and threes, greater density in the frontal forelock region. And of course, proper placement is key. I'm gonna talk about the use of implanter pens. So this is the micro irregularity at the, reg at the level of the graph. We have alternating bundles of greater and lesser density with interspersed isolated hairs. And I'll show you some examples. And the goals are to create a feathered irregular hairline that's forward angled. And Ron Shapiro, uh, who's a, one of the more respected hair restoration surgeons and a friend of mine, talks about the zones, the frontal most feathering, the defined zone, the immediate frontal tuft, the lateral temporal horns, and then the temporal points. And those are the areas to focus on when you're working in the frontal half of the scalp. So the key steps of the design is, first of all, locate the central fr frontal most starting point typically seven to 10 centimeters, most commonly eight, eight to eight and a half from the gobella. Um, locate the frontal temporal angles, connect the two to create the lateral hairline with frontal temporal recessions that can be somewhat conservative. And then when indicated, you can create lateral temporal horns building up the sides when the temples have dropped down, the parietal areas drop down or, and or um, the temporal points. So you can um, you know, create a more aesthetic look. And here's an example of creating the temple, doing some work in the, in the temples, uh, as well as having a little bit of a receded look. And you can see it's, it's not nearly as sharp as it appears in the drawing. And that's because the graft angulation is go, going downwards and forward. So it sort of gives the look of a, of a, of a softer um, and less receded appearance. And here's a before and after 2,400 graphs. And you notice this irregularity. This was a single procedure. With gray hair, older gentleman, 80 years old, it's not really important to go ahead and, and do a lot of single head graphs with his gray hair. We really just want to achieve density. And you'll see I created a, a, a strong frontal forelock. And this is one day after FUE, how quickly it heals. And you can see these little zones of thicker, thinner uh, in the immediate post-op. And that's how I, um, that's why that was created with a combination of two hair grafts here and then one hair grafts right along the frontal edge, made irregular. And this is the, uh, the area of greatest density. So this is where most of the three hair grafts are going to go. 
This is a before, this is one day after, and this is 10 months after. And you can see not only is the angulation and direction good, but you see it gets thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner. So you have that irregularity, that micro irregularity that I talked about. One day and one month after FUE, this healing is very quick. The only thing that heals up as fast as the FUE from the scalp is FUE from the beard. And I'll show you some examples. Most commonly patients uh, these, these days receive a shave FUE. However, quite popular in my practice is a no shave where we don't do any shaving at all. It's a very time consuming process where each individual follicular unit gets trimmed. It's trimmed and then it's removed one at a time. Uh, typically we can get around 17 to 1800 grafts extracted and planted in a single day using the no shave. And then there's the partial shave, which is sort of a, a cross. So patients, if they have short hair, it can look like a fade, or if they have longer hair, it can cover it over. It can work well in women um, or some women, they leave, a, we leave a long hair down here. And then we take a, we shave a large area and then they can wear their head in a ponytail concealing that. But in this case, the partial shave can be attractive. We can usually get with a shave FUE removed and planted anywhere from 22 to 3,000 to 3,500 grafts in a single day, partial shave usually around up to 2,500 to 2,700 and no shave around 1,800. And you can see before and after 1,850 grafts mainly designed to reinforce the frontal forelock. Before and after, I hope I can show you this thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner. So you want this irregularity and also notice hairline is not a perfectly symmetric bowl shape. It's got some irregularity. And here's a FUE 1100 grafts done to the frontal temporal sessions primarily, you usually get excellent results. You can see how nice that density is doing FUE uh, into this, these frontal temporal sessions and doing a little bit of reinforcing along the hairline. And a before and after restoring a frontal forelock. Here's a before and after uh, 2100 grafts. Uh, achieve maximum density here. This is a somewhat high hairline, but it does frame the face. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve here. And once again, thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, hairs are growing in a really anterior direction. This is how we plant the grafts. Uh, it's using implanter pens. In this case, these are uh, dull implanters. So the grafts are being placed into pre-made recipient sites. Basically I've made the recipient sites, then my assistants are planting the grafts in pre-COVID times. Uh, they're planting the grafts that are, the, the grafts are loaded into the implanters and then they're then placed. The advantage of implanters is that not only does it expedite the process because you can use four people planting grafts, but also minimize the risk of damage to the grafts as they're being inserted. And these clearly are the way to go. The recipient sites in this case are 0 0.5 for the 0 1 and the two hair grafts and 0 0.6, sometimes 0 0.7 millimeters for the three hair grafts. And you can see a really impressive result before and after 2,900 grafts. However, in my hands, what's really more impressive is a case like this, at least in terms of the challenges of achieving this. This patient has lots of challenges in achieving a natural result, posterior direction of hair growth, light scalp, dark hair. And so to achieve this kind of result uh, with around 2000 grafts, in my opinion, is one of the more notable achievements. Uh, so these are really the tougher cases to create impressive results. Patients, I, I see these patients, these pictures from patients uh, that have had over harvesting. It's one of the risks of, of uh, FUE is when uh, Doctors try to do more than 25, 2,800 grafts when it's just not indicated. And you can see that this quote permanent zone in reality is not so permanent as guys get older. This is not a scarring alopecia. It's actually due to the hairline riding up on the, on the posterior. So is, is permanent zone is relatively limited. It's more on the sides than it is on the back. So what do we do in these cases? We can use beard hairs. And this was an example of 3,100 grafts, single procedure of both scalp and beard hairs, around 1,500, around 1,400 beard and 1,700 scalp. These beard hairs will grow pretty, pretty similarly to scalp hairs. They're a bit more coarse, so we don't use them along the hairline. And this is another case before a uh, gentleman had prior work done, was unhappy with the density and the anesthetics, non-aesthetics. And you can see though, he doesn't have any donor supply. So we went to the beard. This is after it's healed up, no scarring within three days, it's healed up before and after. We also did some chest hair. Chest hair tends not to be as, as consistent as beard hair. Um, um, so that's why I generally beard is my first area to go to. 
Um, we can get as many as, as 1,500 to 1,800 grafts from the beard below the uh, jawline. And if patients are willing to get rid of their beard, we can go up higher. And then we can also do transplanting from the scalp into other areas of the body. And that's the other form of a body hair transplantation. So can you remove from the back and put on my head? Ha ha, the answer is yes. We take in this case from the scalp and you can see subtle results, but we're able to achieve a more natural look. This is the, one of the more impressive body hair cases. This gentleman's back hair just grew like almost like scalp hair and you can see the results that were achieved. Scalp hair tends to, I mean, beard hair tends to be, have a closer phase to scalp hair, which is a long antigen growth phase. Occasionally beard hair can be somewhat coarse or kinky. The patient was happy. Uh, but this, sometimes it's impossible to prevent this, but this is the exception rather than the rule that these hairs grow this way. And this is a transgender patient who did not want a beard. So we were able to, before, prior to doing, he was going to have his hairline, a brow uh, shaving, and, and, and then I was going to do grafting after that. That was going to be done elsewhere. So I said, well, for now, let's go ahead and you take all these beard hairs. So we started planting them. This was two procedures of around 3,500 beard hairs. Less, he has, so he has less on the face, less to have laser hair removal and more on his scalp. For transgender patients, in this case, a gender reassignment, female to male, beard transplants. There's also a role not for transgender patients, but we talk about beard transplants for sideburns and more extensive work. This is 2,250 grafts. These are more commonly one and two hair grafts. Occasionally I will use three hair grafts for restoring beards before and after 1,900 grafts with the donor area. So the key steps to facial hair transplants is to harvest the grafts using FUE, trim the excess skin, and I generally prefer scalp to beard donors. Recipient site formations are almost all 0.5 millimeters for the one and two hair grafts, occasionally 0.6 if we're gonna use three hair grafts, but that's, a, that's the exception. Really important to have acute angle, and then the graft placement is done with, with implanters, and you can see how the implanter, single person loads it, and then inserts the implanter, and the graft gets placed atraumatically. Nice. And you can see the before and the after. Oh, another one. Graft counts, typically we're gonna do around 2000 grafts for guys getting beards, up around 300 to the sideburns, around four to 800 to the cheeks, for each cheek, mustache three to 450, and goatee non include mustache 400 to 800 grafts. A couple more examples before and after. And this is a chest hair transplant, transgender patient, female to male, to not only conceal the mastectomy scars, but also provide a more masculine look. Uh, the converse, gender reassignment, male to female, eyebrows can create a more feminine look. Eyebrow transplants are a very popular procedure in my practice. I do around three of these every week. And you can see some of the examples, even on black patients, we can achieve before and after nice results. And the concepts of eyebrow design, we're all familiar with brow shapes. Uh, the importance of the flatter male look with a slight arch as opposed to the female where the arch tends to be more lateral. Although many of my females now like the arch more medial, I think it's a very aesthetic look. And then with female, uh, they're typically somewhat shorter. We talked about um, the, uh, the design in terms of the arch. Uh, recipient sites are made almost exclusively with 0.5 millimeter recipient sites. We place as many as 375 grafts per side. And I, I use primarily two hair grafts, but some three hairs. And here you can see how the recipient sites are being carefully made in an angled fashion. So these are the inferior ones, these are the superior ones, and those ha note how we achieve a, a, a cross hatching. And here we are in the um, in this in the uh, in the medial head. So as I said, I really like two and three hair grafts. It maximizes density and does not need to compromise naturalness. The only place I place one hair grafts is in the medial head and the distal tail. And I've done studies that have confirmed objectively that we get nicer results using mostly two and three hair grafts. You can see before and after this gentleman overplucked. You can see a single procedure. Another example before and after, eyebrow, a gentleman. See how I like that slight arch look, a nice flat, heavy look before and after. Uh, and then also implanters are used for inserting the eyebrow grafts. And this is at an early stage of the implantation. So then one gets handed off, loaded. And so it's a two person system. Another example of a gentleman before and after, a woman before and after. 
Eyelashes are occasionally done. I don't recommend them, but if desired, it can be done. And you can see we're actually doing a, a anterior grade as opposed to retrograde insertion. We're actually doing anterior grade threading using a French needle. This is a two hair graft. Skin has been thoroughly trimmed. You can see the results before and after. And we pull the hair through and then it gets placed and then we trim the hairs. These do have to be curled. There's a very small risk of corneal abrasion. It's not happening in any of my patients. We'll typically place 90 to 100 eyelashes per side. And we can do eye, eye, axillary hair restoration, arm hair restoration, pubic hair restoration, another example before and after. Um, also beard restoration could be effective as a form of scar concealer for, for facelifts as well cyber and transplantation. So what do we do when patients have had unesthetic work? And I showed you a further grafting, but in this case, we're actually doing FUE removal. The grafts are perpendicular. There's two, three, even four hair grafts that are poor angulation. You see that just that, that regularity. So what I did was I removed by FUE extraction, I removed the, the majority of the grafts and you can see his result after I've done a number of these cases and with very small punches, we're able to get essentially no, no scarring. And uh, then this gentleman returned at this time for additional grafting done more aesthetically. Here's another example before, one day after and three months after around six, around 1300 grafts, 12 to 1300 removed. You can even do it on the beard. This gentleman had a beard transplant from Israel, was unhappy. Um, so I removed the great majority of the grafts over 1400 of them, I was able to achieve a really nice look. Another way to treat unnatural hairlines is to do hairline excision, basically re excising this frontal one to one, 15, one to 1.5 centimeters, removing all this tissue, closing it primarily, and you can see then the long-term result. This is a gentleman that recently came to me, had too low of a hairline, so what I did was I excised around the frontal uh, 22 millimeters, tightened up his forehead with minimal brow elevation. You can see the absence of his uh, forehead wrinkles afterwards, left him with a fine line scar, and then I did more grafting. So this was him immediately after, and then he came back subsequently and got grafting. So let's talk about hairline lowering surgery or forehead reduction, where basically I'm advancing the entire frontal hairline by as much as around three centimeters, in this case, 25 millimeters. You can see before and after, before and after. I do around three to four of these every week, done properly, there's minimal scarring. And if there is, is any scarring, you can always do some grafting. In this case, gentleman was loaded 22 millimeters. I'm conservative in who I do this on men. No family history of hair loss, no miniaturization. They usually like them to be at least 40 years old, but I will do them somewhat younger. This is almost three centimeters of advancement. And there's a variety of etiologies for high female hairlines. The ones that are good indications for hairline lung surgery are those that have a lifetime history of a high hairline and also male pattern baldness in a transgender male to female patient. Frontal fibrosing alopecia and traction alopecia can be candidates. Those that have female pattern hair loss, therefore progressive nature and therefore male pattern hair loss are not candidates or prior surgery like a brow lift is not a candidate facial surgery. And the hairline lowering surgery basically involves, it's a surgical procedure. We remove the entire hairline forward. It's usually done under general anesthesia, can be done under twilight, takes around 90 minutes. And you can see patient has good scalp laxity. I'm gonna be able to get on her around 25 millimeters. So I've assessed the laxity. It's not a matter of how many wrinkles, but it's how far this goes down, the hairline goes down. And here you can see the incision is made along the hairline, a trichophytic incision. And then I'm, and the design of the hairline comes right along the frontal hairline. Then I bring it downwards. And basically this point then can insert on this point. So therefore I'm able to achieve rounding out and sometimes even more rounding good, out. Good. Good. Anyway, good. after good. the incision is yeah. made, I, I do subgaleal undermining. Good. This good. is a bloodless no, claim. I continue that di dissection with a, a long good. endoscopic um, retractor, which helps go beyond good. the vertex. Now let's go ahead and put and then I will do a, 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 a cycle of mechanical creep. And that's done by applying traction. And then in around 40%, 30 to 40% of cases, I'm then doing a galeotomy, just cutting through the galea. You usually do at most one galeotomy and that usually provides around three millimeters of, a, of an additional advancement at the cost of a slightly higher risk of hair loss. Endotines are then drilled into the desired anterior hairline region. These clips then will engage the 
a forward advanced hairline, and then we'll hold that hairline in, in place for approximately four to six months until they dissolve. And you can see how this rounding out, I'm able to go down here. And then we excise the excess skin with the rounding out, incisions closed in a two-layered fashion, 3O PDS and 5O nylon. The excess, that's with the excising the excess forehead skin. And then you can see the closure. And then here's the epithelialization of the skin edge. If you're unhappy with the degree of de epithelialization made with the ins original incision, this is immediately after. And here's a result one week after. Patients are usually presentable um, at uh, the very next day. But basically, the density is the equivalent to over 6,000 grafts, which is huge. So that's even two cycles of, of hair grafting can't usually equal what we can achieve with the hairline lowering surgery. Uh, but patients have to have a mobile scalp and, um, and also sutures get removed at one week. And if it needed, this was a hairline lowering surgery with some rounding out, and then I did some grafting. This was done for poor grafting. I showed you for some men. This was done for women with un a woman unhappy. This is her at just one week out. I was able to excise all these prior grafts done elsewhere with insufficient density. They were unesthetic. Left her with a fine line scar, brought her hairline down to where she wanted it. And this was a case of frontal fibrosing alopecia where I did balloon expander and then I was able to lower her hairline. Once again, bringing this hairline down here, re removing all the area of which is now inactive frontal fibrosing alopecia and thus was able to give her a more aesthetic look. Frontal fibrosing alopecia is detected primarily with uh, clinical suspicion confirmed by dermoscopy. I'm not gonna go into the dermoscopic findings, but you can see these tiny little nodules and there's almost a transparency to the skin. And you have to be careful anytime you're seeing these patients for transplants, is it, is it male pattern or female pattern hair loss or is it lichen planopilaris or alopecia areata? In this case, patient had lycoplanopilaris. He had a slight patchiness confirmed with biopsy. Is this male pattern hair loss? Well, actually not, it's diffuse alopecia areata. You do a transplant, you're gonna have unsuccessful results. Dermoscopy is very valuable. This patient with frontal fibrosing alopecia and lycoplanopilaris post-transplant 25 years later. We did a fat transfer, autologous fat transfer, got some of the hairs to regrow, then I did additional grafting three months later, and you can see his final result. However, his frontal fibrosing alopecia progressed loss of the temples. So even though this survived, his frontal fibrosing alopecia progressed. And this is how we do the autologous fat. It's an it's a outpatient procedure. We take around 15 to 25 cc's. A couple of other interesting cases, heroic eyebrow transplants, patient had prior tattoo, then done laser or to try to remove it, un, unsightly scarring. I excised all of one part of the other eyebrow. Six months later, did grafting and I was able to achieve a really nice result. Finasteride is always on armamentarium. This is a before, this is an after, before and after. We knew this was gonna work by this test called Trico test, which is a genetic test. Uh, it tests for 13 genes and 48 genetic vari variants based on a mucosal swab. The easiest part is ordering the test. The hard part is interpreting it and then figuring out how to treat these patients usually with compounded formulas. The green represents stuff that patients will respond to, i.e. finasteride, as opposed to um, things that they, that they won't respond to such as steroids. And it's really fascinating all the, the information that we get from this trico test. And then finally, there's scalp micropigmentation, FUE scars treated with SMP, SMP scars into a prior do strip donor site scar. This is SMP or scalp micropigmentation. It's a semi-permanent, lasts around five years, requires two to three treatments and it can be combined with a hair transplant and you can see the results. Basically it makes the scalp look darker and this is a case for crown. So anyway, future developments primarily center around the roles of adipocyte tissue and cell therapy. There's an opportunity for research needed on therapies for a variety of conditions, scarring alopecia, management of scars, androgenic alopecia, continued improvements in technology, regenerative cells, hair cloning. We're actually involved with a proprietary uh, uh, project called Hair Clone. And then final thoughts, uh, hair plays a critical role in self-esteem, increasingly due to changes in scope of procedures, technology results, and ongoing developments and research. It has growing stature in the field of aesthetic medicine. And I'd like to say thank you, and I look forward to hearing any, um, any, uh, any questions. Thank you.